So, um, hello everyone again. My name is Sandra Kuchina. I'm Eden President, also Assistant Director at University Computing Center, University of Zagreb. I wish you a warm welcome to today's session, the last session of this year's year European Online and Distant Learning Week, sixth in the row. Uh, to this year we had we are having eight sessions uh, with 40 speakers and about 700 individual participants, uh, meaning that uh, some of them participated in the number of sessions. Uh, I'm very happy so for such a good response and uh, such uh, uh, and quite a big number of interest uh, to our online distance learning week. Um, what I want to address as well is that this is, event is organized in partnership with Open Distance Learning Association in Australia, with Flexible Learning Association of New Zealand, who are launching uh, Asia Pacific Online Distance uh, Education Week, also with, in partnership with United States Distance Learning Association, who is holding National Distance Learning Week. And also we had a special session by uh, ICDE as our long-term uh, partner and uh, uh, association with whom we have very good collaboration. This week is an excellent opportunity to reflect on the lessons learned during COVID-19 pandemic during crisis. And today our aim is to discuss how education should look like in the post-academic era. Before I start with the introduction of my panelists today, I will just briefly remind you on two slides. This year, Eden is celebrating 30 years of serving modernization in education in Europe. We had really huge number of activities, a uh, big number of uh, members, uh, collaborations, uh, activities, uh, and we are passing all this uh, to Eden Europe, a uh, new association which has to be established uh, because of the Brexit. Uh, I'm very happy that Eden Europe is already functioning and all our events are already organized in collaboration, in partnership with uh, Eden Europe. Also, I would like to say that we are very happy that Eden has uh, received the prize of excellence uh, for institutional contribution to the field of open flexible distance uh, learning by uh, ICDE for 2021. I would say this is the, you know, like cherish on the cake of uh, our anniversary. So we are very happy with achievements uh, we have uh, aimed, we have uh, achieved, but I wish to thank all Eden members, Eden community and people around Eden to help in helping to achieve uh, all our successes uh, in last 30 years. So going back to our session today, Title is Report Card on the Crisis, What is the Legacy of Great Onlining of Higher Education? And I'm very happy to have with me distinguished panelists, speakers today. So let me briefly present them. So this is Georg Dimitrov, Head of Unit and Interim Digital Education, Director of General Education, Youth, Sport and Culture, European Commission. Dr. Joseph Planel Estani, Rector of Universitat Aberta de Catalunya in uh, Spain. Professor Mark Brown, uh, Director of National Institute uh, for Digital Learning at the Dublin City University. Professor Irina Volungevicene, Director of Innovative Studies Institute at Vitatus Magnus University in Lithuania. And Professor Alfredo Soero from University of Porto in Portugal. So thank you, thank you for joining me today for this last closing uh, session where we aim to discuss a number of questions. They may seem quite simple at the first, but I'm certain that replies will not be so simple uh, or even it's not going to be possible to give a quite clear reply to uh, all of these questions. But uh, as I said, our aim is today to reflect on lessons learned and see how the future of uh, high education should look like, what is the role of digital education action plan in contribution to shaping new er European education area, 
has the future of online education been endangered by emergency remote teaching? What, how, how online universities are going to function in the future? What are the recommendation and advices from them uh, to, to higher education? And number of uh, questions so far. I also invite you to join us in discussion uh, by uh, stating your comments and questions in the chat. We will try to address uh, uh, them all. At the beginning, I would like to start with a question which I will address uh, to all my speakers uh, because it's quite uh, uh, general and this is just a brief summary. So uh, my first question would be, if you can briefly summarize from your professional point of you as rector or, or director of unit, as the director of uh, a learning institute uh, of innovative study institute, as a professor with a respective uh, long time experience uh, in education. How do you see the present situation in higher education today? Almost two years after the pandemic started. So after we have started uh, uh, working in crisis, and what we have learned to build a better future, the future uh, we deserve. So I would like to start, Georgi, with you. You are in Ljubljana at the presidency conferences. You have some fresh, uh, new maybe uh, insights uh, from your point of view, uh, from point of view of European, European Commission, uh, what is uh, your uh, opinion about present situation of higher education today? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, and hello to the Eden community, and also congratulations on um, my end uh, uh, for the 30th anniversary, plus, of course, the, the award of excellence, which you have uh, fully deserved. Um, so, um, indeed, I'm, I'm in Ljubljana for the uh, presidency conference of um, the Slovenian presidency on digital education. And um, I think that um, the experiences so far are um, a bit in line with uh, the work that I have been doing in the past uh, around about uh, three, four years, primarily on, on uh, the Digital Education Action Plan. And um, you asked about uh, my views in terms of the experience that, uh, that I have. And my, my experience uh, when it comes to higher education has been primarily in two domains, um, one, um, in terms of innovation policy and how we can uh, support you know, um, higher education institutions and universities um, uh, to be uh, part of the uh, innovation e ecosystem in Europe. I have spent uh, quite a lot of time uh, in this domain. And uh, the other area where I am working now more on is obviously digitalization of, of uh, higher education. And looking back uh, at the two years, um, I, would, um, I would say that... Um, um, in both cases, when it comes to the innovation capacity of uh, universities and any other types of higher education institutions, I'm just using universities because it's a shorter word, but I really do mean any other types, um, as well as uh, for the digitalization. Um, what we have experienced essentially is, um, is, a, is a great uh, um, catalyst uh, and something that uh, should really not be missed. Uh, on the on the side of uh, let's say um, innovation capacity, it's it's very important to realize that um, creativity and um, innovativeness, uh, be it in teaching, be it in the delivery of uh, specific um, online learning uh, or or other workarounds in in very difficult circumstances, uh, have led many people to um, reassess and to appreciate more the, um, um, let's say, the ability to, to deliver um, education also in, uh, let's say, non-standard um, non -standard circumstances. And I think that things like instructional design um, have gained, uh, rightfully so, in importance, uh, because my thesis, um, and as I would think and many of yours would be, that we are going to see a continuation of a blended sort of learning. So it's important to keep that, that openness, that innovativeness, and that... Um, um, ability to, let's say, dare to do things which uh, have not so far been either part of the standard or business as usual. Um, so this is very, very important. It, it has something to do with the, with the innovation um, idea itself and the innovation mindset that we need to support, I believe, very much in universities. And when it comes to the digitalization, which is the core of, let's say, my work so far, uh, well, I think that um, the way I would, uh, I would uh, describe this is that um, it is really 
um, a one of a time uh, moment um, in the last uh, 20, 30 years um, to uh, really um, uh, put um, the um, role of uh, technology and uh, and the digital technology, uh, obviously, um, much more, um, let's say, uh, in the mainstream of what we are doing in terms of education. And I believe that many universities have uh, done this uh, in, a, in a very, very reasonable manner. But obviously, uh, there is uh, many, many more that um, would probably have to follow up on this. So for me, this is a moment of crisis, obviously, but it is really equally a moment of, uh, of opportunity. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Georgi. A very, very good summary. Yes, I think we should seize this as a moment of opportunity to do something differently, to do something better and innovative. So going to you, Joseph, um, you have the issue with different digital technologies because your work is online university. From your perspective as a rector, as a person coming from an online university, how do you have uh, an overview on present situation uh, in higher education today? And um, how should, uh, or what is the future of higher education uh, uh, for us? Uh, thank you very much, President. And first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, discussion. And, uh, and I want to uh, congratulate uh, Eden as well for the 30th anniversary and for the award for, uh, for excellence. Um, I would start by saying what, uh, by, uh, what, uh, what Professor Sanjay Sharma, Vice President for Open Learning at MIT, uh, says that the 21st century starts in 2021. Um, because uh, at the end, uh, we, what we have seen is that technology has become vital in helping to ensure that, uh, no, that no one was left behind. But many challenges appeared, revealing uh, all, a whole set of uh, weaknesses. First of all, uh, it quickly became apparent the lack of digitalized learning resources to facilitate the emergency remote uh, teaching. In the second place, um, uh, we, we have seen a lack of digital competences uh, among teaching staff and, uh, and, and students. Uh, in the third place, and after several months of lockdown, it has become clear that the use of streaming lectures with no further changes on the methodology explain why part of the students, uh, the student body did not uh, welcome this uh, change. And uh, in the fourth place, in uh, distant learning solutions were unevenly adopted around the world. So overall, while it can be argued that lockdown uh, has served to demonstrate the educational potential of technology, the digitalization model of the higher education institutions must be reconceptualized if we are to maintain the quality of the learning process and leave no one behind. Genuine digital transformation means more than simply integrating technology into teaching activities. It calls for a profound organizational and cultural change, and it's about formulating the right questions. In the case of WOC, 25 years ago, that question was, how can technology enable us to do what we are unable to do by other means? This was the starting point for us, for our learning model, a model that has evolved and adapted to different situations in these last 25 years. And in that case, our model that may be different from other institutions, our model is a model in which a student is at the center of the learning process by learning by uh, learning by doing. Um, and uh, in this model, in we, as we see it, uh, technology is absolutely necessary, but uh, alone is not enough. So uh, a, 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 a whole a, a range of other measures have to be taken that probably we will be discussing later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really good points. And you really summarized these first four issues, uh, uh, which are become quite clear apparent uh, uh, after the crisis. Uh, yes, technology itself cannot solve the situation. We really do not need to uh, reflect and, uh, uh, and be innovative, as already Gary said, in, in shaping the, the future we want. So thank you from now. Uh, Irina, going to you as uh, uh, 
uh, as a director of Innovative uh, Study uh, uh, Institute, uh, Institute, Innovative Study Institute, uh, you have been dealing with the digital education for a long time. Also, as a former Eden president, you have quite an experience and overview on what's going on. So from your point of view, how do you see present situation in higher education uh, and how should the future look like? Uh, thank you very much, Sandra. Yes, indeed. Um, I agree with, uh, with the rector that uh, it takes many years to prepare for digital uh, transition. <laughs> And if we uh, were speaking now uh, about the year even 2019, 2018, and, and retrospectively in, into the past, looking into the past, it is still amazing for me now um, to think about uh, uh, the European policy in education with what kind of confidence was digital education action plan planned <laughs> and how strange it was still uh, for the majority of higher education institutions in Europe. We must admit that a small group of conventional or traditional universities or colleges or whatever we may call them, you know, were prepared to a better extent to organize online and blended studies. And of course, uh, Eden, has been always um, in consultation with the open universities mainly on how to proceed, on what to research and how deep to go into this research and um, what are best practices and what are the factors influencing successful development of digitalization within an organization. We have wonderful tools available since 2015 and even early in Europe, like Digicon Org and Digicon Edu and other tools that have been supporting organizations step by step, but only the minority of um, higher education institutions took into really serious consideration and integration of these instruments into practices. And what happened now, and what I would see now, is the really successful consolidation of efforts to rediscuss what this preparation means for us today and to rediscuss where we are now, how digital, digitally enhanced learning and teaching should be happening. We don't question whether it has to happen. We already ask how it should be happening. We already discuss what are the needs of students and what are the needs of teachers and how existing frameworks uh, of uh, quality assurance in, in higher education in Europe might support this new um, digital transition, whether we are put into the framework that we must follow or whether we raise the needs to be more flexible with existing schemes and existing procedures and how we would wish to change the situation. And I think um, we have two things. We have already common understanding. We, we have collaboration in university alliances, in the UA, in, in different, different other initiatives uh, taking uh, ground. We, we have common understanding uh, that we need to develop, that we need common knowledge on existing best practices to learn from each other, from, uh, from our colleagues. And, and um, we, we already need to overcome the barriers, but we don't say that we, something is not possible already. We, we just talk how, how to overcome the existing barrier. And at the same time, we are looking for flexibility. And I think here we have a lot of questions still to address. Uh, in which areas and to, what, to which level we are um, welcoming flexibility that is allowed by digital uh, technologies. So thank you. Thank you, Irina, for pointing out the, the I would say, uh, the loose ends where we are vulnerable uh, uh, and uh, that we actually need to regrouping and strengthen the activities uh, more so that it's more like on a national, international uh, level, not just uh, that it's on a personal or institutional uh, level. So we need to work uh, more uh, together uh, because that will ensure the better success and achievements. Thank you. Uh, going to you, Mark. Um, I know that uh, uh, you have been very busy because your institute, uh, a National Distance Learning uh, Institute, the University of uh, Dublin City University, 
by vocation is institution who should develop uh, new things uh, and support uh, digital education. So what is your overview on the present situation and uh, things uh, which should be done? Well, thank you, Sandra, and, and hello, everyone. It's really nice to be here um, reflecting at this point in time as we come towards the end almost of 2021. My overarching um, impression, if you like, or observation is drawing on that sort of ecosystem metaphor, just how resilient the higher education ecosystem has been. Um, you know, we had an incredible crisis. We're not through it yet, but we got through it. Um, we responded. And so I think we should recognize that in ecology, resilience is a real strength. Um, it might also be what uh, slows down change, but I think that the fact that we were so resilient tells us something, and we should take credit for that. Similarly, the power of human capital, I'm using a, a term that's quite common, let's just talk about it, the spirit of the human, and how we we're able to rise up to the challenge. Um, you know, I'm sure we've all got colleagues that you wondered how they kept going, uh, but we found it in ourselves, not to dismiss that everyone had their highs and lows and challenges, but the, together that human spirit got us through. So those are two, I think, very powerful elements that we should congratulate ourselves. And history, I hope, will judge as being really important. Perhaps uh, I like to see things half full rather than half empty, but that resilience also is a little bit, um, has a two-edged sword to it. So what I learned is just how strong pedagogical beliefs are, the beliefs of the teacher and how difficult it is to challenge those. Because, you know, we do have to be honest, emergency remote teaching was typically transmissional model teaching. Um, that's the default approach, which is, um, again, a dirty little secret we still have in higher education. It's the dominant form of teaching, um, generally speaking. Uh, lastly, I think, um, or maybe I have two more things quickly, uh, learning how to learn online, I think we now just understand as a crucial life skill. It's something that I'm very uh, passionate about in the work that we've done. So I think a takeaway for our learners is how important it is not just to leave them to learn online by osmosis, but they need to be taught how to be effective online learners and my final takeaway, and I think this is going to be something that um, will be with us for a long time, it comes from the change literature, is change and transformation does not follow a straight line. Uh, we also learned that nor do viruses. Uh, so we need to recognize that change is actually lumpy. It's mixed. It's messy. It's not something that's going to be simple. Yes, you, you are quite right. Uh, it's quite messy. I can say it from the perspective of Croatia. <laughs> we have ups and downs, uh, definitely. But uh, definitely learning to learn is important, not only for students, but for teachers as well. Uh, so going back to you, Alfredo, uh, as a teacher, a uh, person who has quite a wide experience uh, uh, of teaching and being present in numerous associations. Uh, and I know always you are supporting teachers uh, saying that they should be trained uh, more. So what is your overview uh, on present situation? You have to turn on the mic. Sorry, I was not ready. Uh, yes. Thank you for the for the invitation to Eden and to you, Sandra. I have to, and hello to panelists and uh, attendees. I just have to continue what you were saying. Is that the question of training the teachers? I think it's fundamental. Um, not only training, but also verifying that they are trained to teach online. Um, I think one of the biggest problems we had in these two years, year and a half, was that many people knew about the tools, the technologies, uh, the gadgets, uh, but they don't know how to teach online. And that was terrible for the learners because some learners had uh, capable teachers and some others had incompetent teachers online. And that is terrible. That, that cannot happen. That's my first point. The second point is that um, this imposed transformation of using uh, remote uh, uh, teaching and remote learning open a lot of options for everyone. 
I think uh, there was a lot of uh, lessons learned from everyone, like Mark has mentioned, also students learn how to self-learn and to learn online. And teachers also knew that they could do other things that uh, they could not do, uh, or they didn't know they could do before. And the third is that, um, and that was, uh, I think, a, a consequence, was that there was a lot of informal learning for everyone that somehow should be recognized. So um, uh, those are my three points, uh, and I'll probably have the chance of talking about other things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. Yes, uh, uh, definitely a lot has, lot has been learned informally uh, because when we met the situation, we had to learn uh, how to adapt, uh, how to use uh, different tools and technologies. So, Mark, um, do you think uh, you said that uh, we showed resilience, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, looking at the cup half full, not half empty, but uh, are we ready to change traditional views and practices uh, by em embracing the, the, the uh, transformative potential of digital education? Actually, why did we need pandemic to be a catalyst for digital transformation of higher education? Please, Mike, uh, turn on the mic, yes. That's all right. I just lost my, my mouse there for a minute. Um, you really put me on the spot there, haven't you? Those are pretty tough questions, two questions. Uh, are we ready, firstly, to transform the traditional? I think the word transformation is typically used very loosely, uh, particularly in the context of higher education. I'm probably as guilty as the next person by referring to transformation without really defining the term. Um, if you take a, a dictionary definition of transformation, it's about an extreme or radical change. So um, in many respects, I think transformation is a bit like a aerosol deodorant. We spray it around, it smells good for a while, but it doesn't really last very long and all evidence of the spray disappears. And I thought I'd bring a little prop with me, you see. I'm transforming here, it smells pretty good, but it's not gonna last long. Um, more practically, I think it helps to make a distinction between um, transformation with a small T, a little T, and transformation as a capital T, a big T, if that makes sense. An example of little T transformation that I experienced last week brought about by the pandemic in Dublin, outside of higher education, is that taxi drivers now take cards instead of cash. For me, this is fantastic transformation with a little t because if you don't have cash, it was always a challenge, especially for people coming outside of Europe when they arrived in Ireland. I think we've seen many small t transformations by individual teachers during the pandemic, small tweaks and adaptations to their teaching. However, I'm less convinced that we've witnessed many really fundamental big T transformations yet. Remember, I said it takes time, though, but in most traditional universities, and I will use university here quite deliberately, conducting and publishing research is still valued at a higher level than one's teaching. The idea of face-to-face -face teaching hours or contact hours has not been removed or transformed for measures of academic workload. And let's be honest, the trans, uh, tra traditional transmission model of teaching is and was still the dominant metaphor, if you like, of teaching, which I referred to earlier. And if I give one other example, it remains to be seen whether the traditional examination is going to be replaced by more authentic forms, more contemporary forms of assessment. In fact, you know, new digital technology can be used to merely replace old ways of doing things with new ways of doing it through digital proctoring, but no fundamental big T transformation. So that kind of leads me to the second part of what you asked, which is why did we need the pandemic as a catalyst? Um, I like an ecological understanding of, of the system we're in. Higher education is part of a complex ecology. The organizational culture of an institution itself is complex and culture can be very conforming. It's very hard to hack the system, 
a little plug for the DigiEd hack going on right now. Hopefully, we'll see some really great hacks of the system. But resilience to change can also be a virtue, as I said previously. Change in an ecological sense usually is gradual. It takes time, and often you don't even notice it. Despite popular opinion, um, universities and educational institutions are not stuck in the 19th century. Technology has already transformed higher education for better and worse, because I spend most of my day answering emails now. So I think that point also shows that transformation isn't benign. And I'll just finish by saying that, again, borrowing from ecology, you can't really change your fundamental DNA. Um, transformation's hard. It's like getting rid of COVID bulge that we perhaps got. I know I did, because it takes real determination and keeping your eye on the end goal and what you really want and not falling back to bad habits. So it's not easy. Yeah, definitely. It's not easy. So I said questions sound simple, but the answers uh, is difficult to, to, to provide. Um, uh, when you're referring to the traditional university, I thought that you had a quite good overview of Croatia because this is the situation uh, we are facing. Actually, uh, uh, I'm hearing because I work with higher education from the high levels uh, that online education cannot replace uh, traditional education, that is just substitute, uh, that we should go back uh, to where we were uh, because this was good uh, and that uh, because of uh, emergency remote teaching, we experience uh, quite lots of uh, uh, bad uh, reflections from students and teachers uh, who didn't uh, find uh, it quite useful uh, because of uh, social uh, aspect and mental health and, and so on. So in a way, um, the results can be endangered uh, uh, by a different, and I would say um, not very uh, uh, knowledgeable uh, information uh, about actually what's online education. But uh, let's go uh, to you, Irina. Uh, we said that... Um, Actually, we needed pandemic uh, to do some uh, uh, changes in digital transformation. Uh, I also invite uh, the, the participants uh, in, in the chat to, to give their opinion. Uh, did we need the uh, pandemic as a catalyst uh, uh, for changes in uh, higher education? So do you think we will be able to retain advantages and benefits of gaining more experience in online education, or we will feel compelled to go back to the normal times? How actually digital faculty in the digital age should look like? You are quite advanced it in, in Lithuania at Vitatus Magnus University, so you can share your experience about it. Uh, yes, yeah, Sandra, and uh, not only, I think. Uh, I think here we have um, uh, to rely upon several things. One thing is uh, whether we have a vision. And uh, I think uh, I'm uh, part of a of, of, of group of people who usually create visions and uh, try to think uh, what we want to be and how our education should look like in five, uh, 10, uh, 20 years. Uh, and I think this is very important because as we have seen uh, from, the, from the past, if, if we didn't have a preparation, uh, we would have failed much worse <laughs> than, than, than we could have imagined. And I think it also depends upon our choice. We are all humans. I believe uh, that um, every um, system, every organization uh, depends upon the vision and the small choices and small decisions uh, made uh, one by one. I think we have to answer many questions. Uh, of course, we should start uh, with uh, the questions, uh, what we would like to see, uh, what students would like to see, what teachers would like to see, what uh, national and uh, um, institutional policies uh, would, would like to embed in, in the visions uh, of, uh, of the institutions. Uh, we have to answer the question, how much we trust science, uh, how much we trust research, uh, how much we are also um, uh, make uh, uh, lessons uh, from the feedback that we receive uh, from our stakeholders. 
uh, we also uh, have to decide about other things. For example, now we see a tech projects uh, on the national level uh, uh, taking uh, good uh, um, advancement. And uh, I always uh, question um, in, in inside uh, uh, and also with, with a group of researchers and with my colleagues in Europe and, and in, in Lithuania, um, how do we see uh, the goals of uh, innovations, uh, economic development, and education? And how fast uh, uh, the impact of education uh, can be uh, towards the changes that we want to see? Uh, we witnessed uh, how quickly and how successfully schools went online, school education during pandemic, maybe not very successfully in terms of methods that they chose. Maybe they had a lot of job piles at the moment. Maybe they did not manage a lot of things, but uh, schools had to move online. And that was out of the question completely before pandemic. <laughs> we can count schools who had experience uh, with, with digitalization. And now we see uh, the merge of unicorns that each country wants to see uh, coming out of the uh, national context. For example, through EdTech, we also want to see how fast we develop and how 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 fast we gain recognition and then i go back to to the to the area of education and ask myself what is the benefit uh, for education out of the digital development out of this new game or, or new tool and i want a very clear description how sustainable it is for education in my country or in europe in a long time perspective so i think these are uh, the really important questions and um, I would, I would think that first we need to think about them, then to try to uh, answer for ourselves uh, how we think and what we would like to see in the future and then which way to go. Um, we need uh, to go back uh, to the questions of um, openness and transparency because digitalization always improves transparency, always improves the openness. And this is our strength in Europe, I think. Uh, at least we always uh, declare it full-heartedly for our colleagues uh, globally because we are prepared for the openness. I, I, would, uh, I would claim that we are. And uh, uh, I think uh, the solutions that we choose now for schools, for uh, vocational education and training, for adult learning, for higher education, uh, also should be based on our values. So if we choose a simple tool, a simple digital instrument, do we contribute to human um, capital development in Europe? Do we contribute to our wealth in the future? Or we choose the solution that we can manage now, but we don't think what will happen in the future with our institution, with our university or school. So I think uh, when we answer these questions, what we want, and when we um, make our choices, then we can uh, say with better confidence whether these lessons will be um, learned. Thank you, Irina, uh, replying with questions on my questions, but very important questions. Actually, we do need to think uh, what do we want and do, how do we want to shape our future. I think this is very important uh, uh, task for all uh, higher education institutions. Um, we do have the plans, uh, we do have the mission and visions of the institutions, but uh, these, I would say, long-term visions going back some years, uh, but uh, how uh, management of institution is open to change uh, this vision and missions based on the lessons uh, learned. This is also something uh, to talk about. So, Georgi, going back, going to you now, um, Digital Education Action Plan, it's been a year and maybe a month uh, after it uh, has started. Uh, it was presented, but actually it started uh, in 2021. So how are you satisfied with its realization after one year, especially because of the pandemic and, and disruption of education for which no one was uh, uh, prepared? And uh, what influence and enhancement uh, DIEP can have on European countries in resetting uh, education for digital age? Well, um, so I can I can uh, maybe just start um, with 
um, 20 seconds of what the digital education action plan is because I see that there are many people here from around the world and I really don't want to take it for granted that um, you know what that is. So basically, this is a European Commission policy for the um, next seven years, as it were, because so long is the programming cycle of the European Union. So it's kind of long term by design. And what this digital education action plan is, is uh, basically um, a set of measures, but also a um, set of two very strategic priorities. One, the need for a uh, um, building what we call a digital education ecosystem, which ranges from connectivity through equipment, through um, uh, infrastructure and the skills of the, of the teachers. And then on the second side, we have the long-term um, objective to, to support uh, continuously uh, digital skills and competences. So I, sorry, I, I had to make that parenthesis. I really don't want to assume that anyone would know that. Um, uh, and um, now um, the, 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 the question on uh, being satisfied, um, I mean, I uh, have my difficulties to be satisfied with something which I, I think is going to be long-term by design, not because this particular action plan is long-term, um, because we want that it clicks to uh, other key policies on finance, on, on a labor market. Uh, we want this to be part of the conversation around digital transformation in Europe and not just uh, in kind of splendid isolation. This is very, very important uh, because um, of the member states. And I'll come back to this in a second. But I also uh, um, uh, am not um, able to be satisfied um, in year one um, because uh, we are just starting. And uh, I think we have uh, um, uh, made actually um, a good start. Um, we have already launched um, a couple of very um, important actions, um, uh, which, for example, on the, on the one side, we, um, we are going to be supporting educators and teachers with uh, development of um, uh, specific guidelines for them on, um, on the one side, on how to deal with AI and data in education and training. Um, this is a big, big topic um, in education, and we would like to uh, propose something which is um, uh, meaningful and practical. Um, and then we have a working group on this, uh, which is going to be working over the next uh, six, seven months still. Uh, and then we have another uh, similar exercise, um, again, to support teachers and educators uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, uh, disinformation. Um, we have um, um, another uh, example that we are not yet done with, but what we are going to be announcing very, very soon, which I believe is going to be a very important initiative at the uh, EU level. Uh, this is the Digital Education Hub, which we uh, are going to be procuring and we are going to be announcing uh, very, very soon. This is about creating an interface at the EU level for cooperation between um, uh, policy practice, research, and also the private sector at the EU level, because we believe that this type of cooperation is not yet as institutionalized as it could have been, and one needs to just compare it with the verticals of, let's say, higher education or maybe the, the school sector to see that this is um, uh, not yet there. So we have a lot of work to do, so that's why I cannot be satisfied, because we, we really need to, to work uh, for, for uh, a number of years, I think, on it. And uh, because of uh, your question on um, the member states, um, uh, I think uh, we have to be very uh, clear as to the competences of the European Commission when it comes to education. Again, uh, for all those not uh, sort of in the know, uh, the Commission does have very limited competences uh, in education and essentially supports the member states. The member states are responsible for designing and for the content. However, because this topic has become so relevant and because of the increasing importance of this uh, policy, the Digital Education Action Plan, which I have mentioned, um, we uh, are seeing more um, influence also when it comes to the member states. And what I mean by this is, I would like to give the, the example, um, it is actually something that we announced in the action plan as well. So it's not uh, something which came uh, on top of it. Um, it's the um, dialogue with the member states on digital education that we are about to launch. We would like to um, go deeper with the member states on the needs, on the gaps, on the bottlenecks, and on their plans when it comes to digital education. We would like to do this over the next year. So it's going to be a time-bound process. It's going to be something which involves the top level of the 
uh, political leaders in the, um, uh, in the member states. It was something which the president of the European Commission announced um, two months ago when she called for uh, leaders' attention to digital skills and education. And it was something that a project group of commissioners, so a very high level group of commissioners uh, from different parts have put their weight on. And um, I believe that over 2022, we are going to see also more exchange and deeper conversations with the member states. And this is a very important aspect for us because traditionally um, we are really not doing this uh, sort of uh, every so often. But because the situation is so exceptional and because um, everyone seems to be intuitively realizing that the relevance of this topic is so huge that we cannot just, let's say, leave it to, to be as business as usual, we are taking th those measures. And we will also look together um, with the RRF, uh, the Resilience and Recovery Plans, and um, uh, the European semester into how member states are actually addressing digital education in a more sustainable way. So uh, I am being a bit modest with the expectations here because we have to run this process first and we have to see at the end of next year what the result will be. But uh, the opportunity for sure is, is there. And uh, just final um, uh, element to, to mention uh, that um, uh, the um, contribution of the Digital Education Action Plan um, is a long-term one and um, um, it is something that will help to build the European education area further. And this is very important because it is really about the European education area and not about the different, let's say, enablers of it, be it internationalization or digital and this and that. These are the things that will make European cooperation work even better. And I think that we have excellent experience in Europe when it comes to cooperation between education and research. The most popular program is called Erasmus. And I think that um, this is the ultimate objective. So I do believe that, of course, with the relevance of digital and the relevance of the uh, flagship we have on the table, the Digital Education Action Plan, we will be able, of course, to probably leverage this uh, because the times are uh, right to do that. And I think it's our also responsibility a bit in the commission to, to, to do that because the member states are also expecting it. And by the way, the stakeholders as well. Great, uh, very good to hear about the number of actions uh, that you are performing. I'm looking forward to Digital Education Hub, but also I very much welcome this uh, communication with the countries, with the uh, high state profile uh, people management. I think it's very much needed to uh, be uh, aware of the present state of what's going in uh, each country and to able to tackle these issues with them and see how it can be uh, solved or proposed uh, some actions in a way uh, that they found the solution. Uh, we will wel welcome you very much in Croatia, definitely. Uh, so great. Uh, thank you for, for the answer. Yes, I know with just one year uh, since the, the Digital Education Action Plan is out, but you know, uh, although it's a long-term uh, plan, uh, always uh, the, the first actions are very important, you know, to see how it has landed, you know, uh, on the floor. Uh, does it spread the seed uh, or, or it's not? So, yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, Joseph, going to you now. Uh, uh, UAC is celebrating 25 years already. My God. Uh, university was started with the idea to take the advantage of incipient web worldwide web to create first ever distanceless university and have been very successful in it. So uh, congratulations on, on, on your 25 years. But uh, my question to you is, are online universities living the renaissance in response to pandemic world? And what lessons can we take from online universities in effective implementation of online education. Are we likely to see the new generation of online universities arising from crisis? What would be your answer to that? Yeah, let me start by the, by the end. Uh, in fact, I don't really know if uh, we are likely to see new generation of open universities or if universities are leaving their renaissance in response to the pandemic world. But uh, what I know for sure is that a lot of brick and mortar universities are combining or will be combining in the future both face-to-face -face and virtual methodologies 
uh, tackling their own digital transformation. Some of these will probably start offering distance education as a complement of their uh, of their main activity. So uh, I think that uh, the future of higher education will be for sure more digital than uh, it is at present. And open universities have the duty to lead this transformation from, uh, from our own experience. Education in a virtual environment is not only a mere technological issue, but one that requires planning, commitment and complicity. The willingness of the institution to work online is not enough. It is necessary to create the whole infrastructure to support governance and management. In our, in our own experience, and thank you for the, uh, the, the, the 25th anniversary, now, now we have become uh, a young university, only 25. Um, uh, in our own experience, uh, there are four basic pillars that sustain digital transformation. Uh, the, 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 the starting point of the first one for any digital transformation must therefore be to define the university model itself. So the first thing is that the university defines uh, which is the niche of students or the model uh, that the university wants to, wants to be. And being digital means that the whole institution works with the same model or pattern. In our case, uh, 3,000 uh, subjects, structure, organized, and technology powered in the same way. The second uh, pillar is uh, to bolster the digital competences of all those involved in the process. So it is in line, it goes along with the digital education uh, action plan mentioned by Georgie. Uh, so the, the need that everyone involved uh, has the digital competences. It is essential to raise levels of digital literacy and to develop digital competences in the general public, but also specific training is needed to the education professionals responsible for implementing the digital transformation, both the teaching staff and anyone involved in teaching innovation. For us, the third pillar is the, is the one that uh, promotes quality assurance mechanisms, with uh, quality assurance mechanisms based on collaborations, or collaboration with all the agents involved in the regulation of uh, distance higher education. And uh, the fourth pillar, which uh, last but not least, uh, is uh, it is crucial to perform joint research and collaborative work for evidence-based digital transformation. And in that sense, uh, um, I think that the work that uh, Eden has been doing is crucial to reinforce joint collaboration between academics and, uh, and institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for pointing uh, very good that uh, we do need uh, uh, to train teachers uh, to be able uh, uh, to teach uh, uh, in different environments than, than uh, just uh, uh, traditional uh, lecture, lecture room uh, 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 teaching and uh, that uh, collaboration is uh, of very importance. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going now to you, Alfredo. Uh, I have prepared the question from you, but I see that in question and answer, we have one question. I think it's just written, uh, it's written based on your uh, first reply. So if you don't mind, I will move to this question, uh, which says, I understand being a professor is inspiring, being by the side of the students, supporting them, and being an example when teaching, when passing on information. How do you see online education helping these four aspects? I think this is a question just for, for you. So please, would you like to answer that? Okay, I'll try. Um, uh, as you know, I've been involved uh, with the area of e-learning and distance learning for many years. and. Uh, uh, I, I knew the first rector of the Open University of Catalonia, Professor Ferrate, so uh, I'm that old. So uh, going to the um, going to the, the this specific uh, issue, I think that uh, online is one big advantage uh, about uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, teaching and learning, which is the possibilities of communication and circulating information. Uh, I think that's the biggest advantage of. Uh, of the online tools that we have so far that we haven't exploited. I think we have to deconstruct the models that uh, we had because uh, what happened in this pandemic was people were replicating what they were doing in the classroom 
And that's not how it's supposed to be. You have to deconstruct the model and build new models for online learning in terms of um, using the tools. For instance, one that, that I see that it uh, uh, has a high potential is the simulation. Uh, you, you can do incredible things. There is a, a university of medicine, a German university uh, based in Cyprus, that it's doing all its courses online without... Um, uh, with simulation, and for me, there I'm an engineer. I, I think it's the possibilities are immense. But uh, concentrating on the on the question that I didn't see, I'm sorry. It, it's the um, the the point that uh, uh, the digital tools and distance learning can facilitate mostly communication. We can communicate uh, anytime with anywhere, and uh, and communicate almost everything we want to transmit. Of course, learning is a personal thing. We have to understand that learning is personal. We can dance, we can, we can sing, we can tell jokes, but the, the learner will learn if it wants to and if we give them the right models to learn. And that's where I think the distance learning can uh, help uh, the teacher have more potential in transmitting the, the, the pedagogical model to the to the left. I don't know if I answered, but it's the best I can do. Thank you. Just just to add, um, I know that uh, in education we are very much focused on content, and uh, uh, I think that traditional uh, types of learning are basically focused on teaching, not on learning, and much more on the content than on the skills. Um, do you see that uh, uh, online education provide the better uh, way uh, to, to, to work on the development of skills for teachers and students? Uh, again, it's the question of uh, why are we here, right? Why are the teachers there? Why are the it's because of the learning outcomes. It's the, the competences they will acquire. And from that perspective, I think that the digital uh, tools can provide a better understanding of why we are spending time trying to teach people and people are getting to learn what they eventually need. I'm, I personally... I'm very concerned with uh, the assessment, especially the assessment online. And I think that there's a lot of work to do because uh, for those that are in the formal, in the institutional uh, learning and teaching, uh, the exams are terrible. I mean, they are stressing event. And personally, I think they are most of the times unfair to, 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 to the students and to the learners. So we have to work a lot on the assessment and produce better tools. And they're the digital tools uh, with the simulation, with the portfolios, with um, uh, records of what the, 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 the learners have done, etc. I think that we can do incredible things if, uh, like, again, like I mentioned in my first intervention, if the professors are prepared to do it. And we have to work on the preparation of the professors. And it's not using the tools. It's not, uh, for instance, the digital competence framework. It's good, but it's not pedagogical. It's not the pedagogical framework. So we have to teach, uh, we have to make the, the teachers and trainers to learn how to teach online. Thank you, Alfredo. I think it's a very good point, uh, but we have to be aware, uh, aware of. Okay, um, so uh, let's move, Irina, a question for you. Um, how can associations such as Eden help uh, higher education institution in digital transformation? Uh, what, uh, uh, you were in Eden uh, UK for a number of years and still are present. Uh, we, you were one of the founders of Eden uh, Europe. Uh, you have great visions uh, uh, and perspectives on how things should uh, look like. Definitely, Eden provided the good ground, the good platform co for collaboration. Um, what uh, uh, 
we are now in verge of establishing, we have established already, but with new association in Europe, we can do things differently and even better. Uh, what do you think we need to undertake to meet the increasing demand of, uh, of higher education uh, and helping the higher education institutions? Eden is um, very European uh, in terms of um, uh, fostering collaboration, building bridges among uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, research and practice communities and uh, sharing best practices, uh, initiating peer learning. So these are the strengths that allow us uh, since many years and not to provide solutions, expert solutions um, as such uh, per se, but to rediscuss uh, and uh, renegotiate uh, with the, every context, uh, including global context, because Eden also has very, very important and um, valued uh, global partners all over the world. Uh, what uh, are the factors that would affect um, integration of uh, one or another innovation in education in a successful uh, way or could cause some risks and failures? Innovations in education uh, need uh, some keywords uh, so that they are better understandable for the majority of stakeholders in education and on all levels of education. And uh, knowledge development is very important, and I think we have experience in that, and this must be continued. So the transformation in the concepts and keywords uh, is also uh, going on in parallel for many years. Uh, when we talk about uh, virtual mobility, open educational resources, open educational practices, uh, micro-credentials, for example, now we always... Um, try to elaborate and in, increase the scope of the discussion in terms of what it affects and what might be the impact of one or another scenario uh, taken. Uh, as an example, um, when we are invited, um, experts from Eden Network are invited usually to consult uh, national policymakers, international organizations and groups uh, on one or another area of uh, digital education. I think the best that we can do is uh, to introduce uh, uh, the criteria, how we can, and, and the measurement indicators, how we can measure this innovation and the, the characteristics, how can we describe this innovation? And then uh, to discuss what implication of one or another scenario could happen, uh, what implication we can anticipate. Uh, so actually, um, I think, uh, we, we have been doing it successfully, but as you, Sandra, mentioned it correctly, we also go uh, under transformation because we need to transform as well as an organization. And Eden will, uh, I'm sure, I'm confident, it will take all the best uh, values uh, from, the 30th year, from the 30 years of existence. But at the same time, uh, now in, in uh, Europe Digital Learning, uh, uh, Eden Digital Learning Europe, we put uh, on a very, very high um, priority level such values as openness, uh, also transformation in, in, in management, including national associations as our very important stakeholders within Eden, uh, partnership with global associations as well in order to learn from each other, um, and many, many other things that I think would correspond to the values of Europe, and also to transfer the European uh, instruments, tools that have been successful through the years also to other uh, continents and countries. We think this is a very important time for us not only to support our European institutions, but also to support globally uh, institutions that uh, address the same challenges. So I think uh, we are in the process of transformation. I hope to hear every voice and every opinion um, and take it in on, on the table uh, to the management board of Eden uh, Europe and general meeting of Eden, uh, Eden Europe and to openly address this and to find solutions and to, to analyze successes and failures and then to feedback uh, to, our, um, 
to our region, to our Europe and our education policy as well with, with those that we, with this feedback that we collected. So I think this is our mission and I'm sure that we will continue with it. Thank you. Yes, uh, I agree with you. Uh, just from this webinar today, we see that our participants are actually on a global level coming from really a number of countries out of Europe uh, as well. Uh, what was, I could say, uh, the the uh, confirmation to us when was uh, when pandemic started and we started with these webinars online together, providing the space, the platform for everyone uh, facing this uh, disruption and looking for a place where they can talk, discuss, find new ideas, uh, find the solution, see that it's not that they are not alone and there are others who are facing the, the same problems. And actually, the strength, the strength of our community, uh, because I would say that uh, Eden members are really um, uh, uh, people with heart and soul devoted to education uh, and, and the, their job as educators, uh, contributed uh, to that, that Eden actually could be, I would say, uh, a, a platform for uh, uh, transparency in incoming and outcoming information, you know, so that they are uh, visible uh, to, to everyone. And I think that is one of the uh, the, the best uh, uh, strength of, of Eden as such. But uh, let's not praise uh, our ourselves, although we do have a, a little uh, bit. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, opinion. Uh, Mark, uh, I will go back to you now. We have uh, heard uh, several times so far uh, the issue of research, the importance of research, uh, which has been quite rich uh, last uh, two years because actually they could research on the present situation and things which are uh, still going on. But um, what is my uh, question to you? We have lessons learned. We have results of research. How to move from the point that we know something actually to implementing it and move forward? Well, Sandra, that's an uh, excellent question because I guess in part I'm contributing to that research community, um, adding bullet point recommendations and various reports and, and I'm reading those reports, but I'm also starting to get almost overwhelmed with the amount of research and I'm starting to filter it a lot more critically because I think we're at a point where less talk and more action is probably desirable or maybe the talk and action go hand in hand. So I think we really have to walk the talk. Um, and this is one of the challenges we've had that the research community can't be siloed from then being challenged to put the ideas the evidence-based um, thoughts and experiences into practice. Um, and what we know, again, about large-scale change is important. This was known before the pandemic. We have to walk the talk. We have to have the change owned by all. Um, I'm not great on top-down visions. I think visions come from the community. Uh, sometimes there's a body of literature that says vision is what you end with. Um, without wanting to sing DCU's praises too much, you have to win the hearts and minds of the community. So three, maybe possibly even four years ago, as a part of an envisioning exercise of what the university wanted to do in the future, we held a 24-hour online um, DCU Fuse event, which was the first time many of the staff actually learned to be learners online. Um, went, as I said, for 24 hours, not dissimilar to the DigiEd Hack event going on, walking the talk, bringing people with you. Um, middle out change is very important as well. Many of us are in middle positions. Um, we talk about top down and bottom up change. The middle out shouldn't be underestimated. It's the glue that joins things together. Ultimately, though, we all have a degree of personal agency. We can all be change catalysts. When I hear someone says, oh, the university hasn't done this or the university hasn't done that or some institution, we're part of that. And if we just sit back and accept it, then it will be what it is. So we have to be activists. And then plans are important. Um, plans at all levels. It's a sort of slogan, but if you don't plan, then you fail to plan. 
And one really important thing I think that's missing right now from the research literature, and I say this quite convincingly because we've been analyzing the literature around the student perspective, the student experience. You know what? The student voice, despite our best efforts, is not that clear in coming through. Um, there are only a couple of publications that have actually been co-authored with students. Most of the student voice is done through surveys. And that's not a student voice. That's someone else telling the student voice. So I think we also, in those plans, need to hear a lot more from students. There's been a great experience here in Ireland from the Irish Universities Association where they crowdsourced what students said they wanted the future of higher education to be. So, you know, students can be a powerful change force here if we want to harness them rather than manage and control them. So um, ultimately, if we're not committed to change, and we're not going to win hearts and minds and bring people with us, we'll get the change that's given to us. Yes, Mark, you are right. Students have to be heard. Uh, it's important. Uh, I know that we are doing lots of surveys, uh, but basically, uh, we hear one or two students. We do not hear uh, uh, actually all of them, and uh, they are the other people for for whom we are doing all this. You know, so. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, okay, um, Alfredo, uh, going back to you, uh, support to teachers to become digitally uh, skilled. This is something we need, we want. We have already been providing it uh, 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 for some time. Um, your advice and an expert in that field, how it should be organized, how it should be provided. Well, uh, thank you, Sandy. You make me different, difficult questions. So, yeah, I mean, Eden, I, I forgot to mention, but Eden has a, a top teaching online permit, uh, which is a competence framework for teachers online. And um, all, all of us have a lot of experience. I didn't mention either, but the WOC was the first uh, world online uh, university, totally online. So, for instance, organizations like the WOC know how to prepare their own teachers to teach online. And uh, you, some of you know that I come from uh, mostly from the continuing education and lifelong learning uh, from UCAN, et cetera, et cetera. And there, the online courses, uh, not only here, but in the United States and China, they, they are common. And... Um, what has been happening is that the people that teach online in those areas for the adults, for the lifelong learner, for the professionals, either they are successful or they lose money. Most of them are private. They are profit organizations, not the public like the public ones. So what I'm saying is that this, um, how do I say, this expertise, this uh, knowledge, this competence to train Online teachers exist, but exists probably in places where we do not looking for it. And um, my recommendation is, for instance, take a look at what has done. Take a look at uh, what Coursera does and other uh, and other organizations. They know how to teach online because they have to maintain their own uh, learners. Because if you are an engineer, you're taking a continuing professional development course online. And it's not well done. You will not uh, come back again. You will you'll quit and probably ask for the money back. So you have to be uh, aware that this competence exists. We just have to put it in place. I was hearing the European Commission talking about the policies, etc. Don't forget the competent training of teachers online, because if you don't have competent teachers. Online will never be constant, and I think it should be one way or the other. I believe in the Uber learning. <laughs> I think that people will learn like they pick a Uber. And uh, when they do that, they, they probably will try to find those that have good teachers online, and they will find the good courses, and those will survive. And the function from, for the universities, as I see it, is probably becoming 
a validating center or accreditation center of competences provided by the Ubers. That that is my that is my perception for the future. But we'll see. Thank you, Alfredo. Thank you. A good point. Uh, okay, um, uh, Georgi, uh, uh, let's go to you now. Uh, definitely, uh, this pandemic is continuous. There is no ending. I don't know uh, if we going to face the end or and, and when, so no one can predict that. Uh, institution teachers and students are exhausted already with present situation. Um, so how do you think, what do you think, what will be the challenges for 2022 in higher education? Very important mark, uh, uh, mark from Mark was that we need to see, hear the student voice uh, as well. So what are uh, opinion of, of European Commission or, or your uh, about um how how it's going 2022 to look like so if you allow me i just want to uh, quickly reply back to alfredo who made an excellent point and i, I you know it's not to boast but uh, as part of the first year of the action plan we already launched three different um measures which are all um addressing digital competences of teachers one is a proposal for a council recommendation on blended learning for primary and secondary it's really a very, very interesting document because we have never gone in this area. I know it's not relevant for higher education, but uh, it's an interesting example. Two, it's the Selfie for Teachers tool uh, that supports teachers um, with their digital capacities. And three, it's the um, um, Erasmus Teacher um, Academies. So just in parentheses to, to just reassure you that, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to, to, to just list things that we are doing, but I, I absolutely agree with what you've said. Um, now, um, I want to um, address your question, Sandra, which is excellent, with, with two, two, two different perspectives. Uh, personally, uh, if, um, uh, if the question is what, uh, what we kind of should be, should be looking into next year, uh, given the very difficult and also, I mean, psychological situation, um, I think that we, especially those of us that are in positions where uh, we are able to transmit information um, that others either uh, read or listen to or somehow communicate. And in fact, every single person here around this virtual table is doing that nowadays because we are very connected. So it's really not about the question of hierarchies or everyone can do it. I think we have to be a little bit responsible um, with the, um, uh, let's say, a possible pushback towards this digital, let's say, um, uh, digital turn. Um, because history has shown that uh, for every extreme uh, move, there is another uh, counter move and we need to be very responsible um, and um, explaining what, it is, what we really contribute as an added value uh, when it comes to the quality of um, education. Um, I think this is the, the, the main point because otherwise this fatigue and exhaustion uh, can easily go into... Um, well, um, uh, rejection even and, uh, and so forth and so on. So I, I do want to recognize that there is this element which is also already kind of there, but it is in the responsibility of those who know this best to also share this in a, um, really in a responsible manner without, um, without uh, let's say, the, the, the hype or the, the counter uh, element of it, which I think we have seen for the last 10 years, uh, plenty of times. Um, so we really have to mainstream it. It needs to be a bit more normal than it will you know, replace universities or it will have no role whatsoever. So it's, as always, in media threats. The second point is more institutional uh, from the side of the commission. And um, um, we are working on Excuse me. We are working on a, a new strategy for European universities, and um, in this new strategy, uh, we will of course address the digital transformation, and um, we will um, identify the importance of it and um, propose some specific measures that will um, support the digital transformation of, of higher education in Europe. What I think we will, however, do is we will integrate it into the overall objectives around uh, the cooperation, the transnational cooperation, which is at the core of the European work and uh, in education and uh, research as well. We will also like to stress a bit more the um, international uh, role. And by international, I mean really the global um, uh, outreach and the global role of European uh, universities. 
Um, and also we will talk about uh, the values. And uh, I think it was Irina who mentioned it. Uh, we will also talk about the values because ultimately it comes back uh, to some of the values that we stand for. And we need to be thinking about them because technology does have some implication on it. Um, it's not to, to be protectionist or anything like this, but to recognize the deep, um, let's say, the, the deep role that values do have in shaping technology in future. So we will propose this uh, new strategy early next year. And uh, I think it's time to um, broaden the horizon and to think about the, the, the big picture, perhaps to zoom out a little bit this uh, digital let's say, um, uh, focus that, that uh, we have had, even though I'm, of course, the first supporter of it. But um, it helps out to see how it is integrated in the bigger picture of where society is moving. And we will, of course, um, um, put uh, specific calls in the Erasmus program already uh, in November now. Um, we will, of course, have a number of digital priorities more than before. Um, uh, which are going to support specifically um, a number of uh, different areas which we believe are, um, let's say, more, uh, more interesting for a cooperation in 2022. So, but that's more on the program, program side. Thank you. Thank you. Very good news. Uh, looking forward uh, to that. But definitely, yes, uh, zoom out and have an overview actually not focus on just one thing but to see how it can uh, enhance the society uh, as such uh, not forgetting the ecosystem uh, sustainability of uh, a number of issues and citizens and such how they live in a society uh, today uh, thank you joseph going back to you um i would say that uh, Georgi has opened a little bit uh, 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 the line to your question, uh, which, uh, which I have for you, for you is, did online education lose, lose its proper meaning and distinguished qualities in rush to emergency remote teaching? If so, uh, what got lost? So did we lose the value uh, of online uh, education by this emergency remote teaching? Thank you, yeah. Uh, firstly, I, I think that is, it is essential to distinguish the emergency remote teaching that uh, education systems had to adopt as a response to the pandemic, to COVID-19 crisis, from what it is quality online education. Uh, now, we have to explain to traditional universities, to students and to the whole society, that what was done during the crisis to keep instruction is meaningfully different from a well-planned online learning experience. We have to assure that all of society is able to see the difference. If we fail to do so, open universities may be facing a regression in terms of reputation, mainly in those countries where e-learning has had to make a great effort to be recognized as a quality form of education. In fact, I firmly believe that quality online education is nowadays more meaningful than ever and that it has nothing to do with uh, the improvisation uh, done during the pandemic. Additionally, uh, quality online education is one of the more effective and efficient methodologies to achieve the SDG on, ed on quality education uh, for all. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for, for stating the importance of quality of education. Uh, we did not have time to, to talk about the number of issues relating to online education, ed education as such, uh, going from quality, micro-credentials, uh, student voice, uh, uh, the others, I, I just slipped my mind, but definitely uh, exams which is very painful, a painful issue. I think we would need a, a number of uh, sessions uh, to tackle all of this issue. We are coming to the end of uh, our panel today. And for the end, I would just like to each ask each of you briefly. Uh, usually we say, let's summarize uh, what will be your predictions. Uh, what do you see, how it's going to look like uh, or so. My question to you would be, what do you think are the biggest mistakes or risk we need to avoid in our efforts to build a better future of higher education. So what would be your idea of what your perception 
uh, what should we avoid uh, in building uh, the future of education we want, not what is served to us. So maybe Alfredo, let's start with you. Open, open the mic, please. Yes, I was uh, typing to Mark about the, the conference without walls, without the universities without walls. So my 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 final remark is that um, we 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 should take um, advantage of um, uh, everything that it's done or it was already done because there are a lot of good uh, work and we should um, try to 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 do more research. One of the things that I see. Um, is that there is not enough research, for instance, in assessment of competences. There is very little uh, work done uh, by researchers of online. And I think it, it should increase because it's fundamental for the, the, the question of quality. We were talking about quality of education. And I, like I said, I'm an engineer and I have this principle, what you cannot measure, you cannot improve. So you, you have to measure. And to measure, you have to use the right tools. The learning outcomes and competences we have are very different. And uh, we should uh, uh, employ assessment methods and techniques that are suitable for each type of learning outcomes and competences. You don't assess an attitude the same way you assess knowledge or skills. So, and that is not, from my point of view, sufficiently researched. We have to do more research. So, uh, let's say that my final comment is support the research and target it towards uh, online and specifically towards assessment. Okay, thank you. Irina, your final sentence on risks uh, and mistakes? I would say three things. Um, uh, maybe the first mistake would be to go and search for comfort zone in the past. Um, because this is an illusion, and then I think we could all lose ourselves. Uh, the second would be to lose um, self-criticism uh, and the reflection on, on our actions uh, constantly. And the third, uh, I would go to the positive side, and uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, the main condition is to keep the balance. Uh, balance is important everywhere, so not to lose the balance, or I would say to keep the balance. Thank you. Joseph, what will be your final words? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, um, uh, I think that, uh, that it's not a question of face-to-face -face versus online learning. Instead, we need to determine which of the many ecosystems possible is best suited to the type of learning we want to provide and the type of students that uh, it's aimed at, so that uh, to ensure that uh, no one is left behind. And in the in in uh, in the second place, I think that another challenge universities need to deal with is the fact they are that they are no longer the only actors to provide lifelong learning. Platforms such as Google or LinkedIn. Large communication companies like Microsoft are making a strong bid for lifelong learning and the provision of uh, micro certification of uh, short term training for upskilling professional profiles. So, the risk for universities is precisely not to become obsolete against uh, these initiatives. Uh, they have to differentiate uh, themselves from these other actors. The university must uh, have the aspiration to become a key institution in this new era in new era, as the world's greatest generator of knowledge. Science and research and the democratization of knowledge, as uh, it has been demonstrated during the COVID-19 crisis, are fundamental to the progress of humanity and universities must be active in claiming their central role in this, uh, in this sense. Thank you. Perfect. Yes, uh, university has to be competitive and to define themselves in order to others institutions providing uh, lifelong learning uh, and other modules uh, of uh, informal and formal education, uh, which are present on the market and for which we are going uh, very often uh, to uh, work wanting uh, some short uh, uh, modular education that will provide us with the, the skills we need at that moment. Okay, Mark, your your time. Well, I'm conscious time is almost up. So really quickly, um, yes, technology matters, but 
educators matter most. And uh, I think we have learned just how important the role of the educator is in achieving our end outcomes. You know, for me, if I want to develop more creative, innovative and imaginative learners, the prerequisite for that is more creative, innovative and imaginative teachers. The big mistake I think we have to avoid in creating such teachers, or shall I say working with them and building those sorts of mindsets, is uh, avoiding a supply-driven approach to CPD, to professional development. What we've got is a real supply of professional development. There's, There's an overwhelming range of opportunities but we need to understand the demand part of it because the people who really we need to get to are not the ones typically taking up these experiences. And probably I'm talking about the people who are with us right now are not the ones we really need to be addressing. Yes, good point. Good point. And Georgi, you are now last to be able to summarize it's difficult because these points were excellent. So I really want to thank uh, the four of, of you before. Um, I think that we we probably, I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm, I'm not really the, the, the specialist in higher education, but I think that it's um, it's important to not lose um, kind of um, the, the, the forest uh, uh, because, uh, you know, we're looking just at a couple of trees and um, we need to, to to be thinking about the the role of the the university in this big, big, big transformation, which I argue uh, the the, the digital transformation is, despite the the fact that everyone is tired of hearing it. And uh, we need to be thinking of uh, where the students are going to. And this is a very important point because they are voting with their feet and uh, or with their uh, whatever computers. And it's a very important point. And the point about the lack of research in that is, is, is probably a little bit worrying. Uh, so actually, it would be interesting to, to see how we can perhaps close this type of gap. Because, um, I mean, short-term shocks are always bringing people out of their balance. But in the longer run, uh, peop- uh, uh, let's say the, the changes that happen tend to be underestimated. So I, I think it's very important because of that to be um, in collaboration with also the institutional leadership of the universities and um, organizational change is important. um, And it is a place where we have to also be thinking of when it comes to the um, uh, transformation of uh, of, uh, higher education in the future. Uh, The biggest mistake would be to just forget what we saw uh, last uh, last two years. Thank you. Thank you. We have come to the end of uh, our session today. I wish to thank my panelists for excellent uh, visions uh, and uh, overviews. Uh, I think that each of you had uh, time to get some food for thought, you know, to think about it. Uh, this is uh, the, the one of the discussions about uh, this issue. I think many more are still to come in order that we move from the lessons learned actually to some actions and start performing. Changes take time. It's complex. It's dirty. It takes a, a number of, of ups and downs. But I think that what's the best is the enthusiasm of all of us working in it and a collaboration, which is very important because one person cannot make the change. It's it's a, it's a crowd, it's a, it's a forest that can do it. So with these thoughts, I'm closing the this year European Online Distance Learning Week. Thank you participants, thank you panelists. See you in another occasion. Thank you again. Thanks, Sandra, thanks everyone. Thank you very much, bye-bye.